All right, now you're wondering what happens to sperm after they leave the epididymis. It is time to find out. They are going to travel from the epididymis all the way through all these little tubules in the epididymis from the epididymis down here to the tip of the vas deferens. So where this does this little U-turn down here, that is the end of the epididymis and the start of the vas deferens. It's also called the ductus deferens. Uh, the McKinley textbook makes uh, always calls it the ductus deferens. Most people call it the vas deferens. And uh, honestly, cutting it is called a vasectomy. So vas deferens makes sense. It then travels up through the spermatic cord. And like we saw before, it goes up around the back of the urinary bladder. So this is looking from the posterior side. It's going to merge with the urethra down here, but first it's going to go through three glands. I do want you to know the names of those glands, although you don't need to know which fluids each gland produces. So the first uh, are the seminal vesicles. Those are these here. And uh, after passing the seminal vesicles, the two vas deferens uh, pass through the prostate gland. The prostate gland is about the size of a walnut. And um, it is where the vas deferens and the urethra fuse. Uh, and as a man ages, the prostate gland often uh, swells and um, grows in size. And an enlarged prostate can push on the sphincters that control urine flow and also push on the bladder, which is why uh, old men sometimes have uh, trouble uh, like they have to pee all the time and they have trouble controlling their urine. Finally, the last thing that contributes to the semen is the bulbourethral gland. The bulbourethral glands are here and here. They're situated within this layer of muscle that makes up the floor of the pelvic cavity. So three sets of glands, the seminal vesicles, one on each side, one prostate gland, and then two bulbourethral glands. These produce most of the fluid that is in the semen. Uh, in fact, after a man has had a, a vasectomy, um, he will still make sperm. It'll still be made in the testes. It'll travel into the vas de deferens. It'll get to a cul-de-sac and be reabsorbed by the body. Uh, and you won't be able to tell a difference in the volume of sperm because the sperm is actually very, very small proportion of the volume of the semen, even though there's hundreds of millions of sperm in every ejaculation. So the volume comes from here, and these include sugars to uh, provide nutrition for the mitochondria. Uh, it includes an alkaline fluid to um, neutralize the acid in the vagina. It includes a lubricant to help the semen uh, be transported through the urethra, number of things like that. It's very complicated fluid semen. And then uh, during orgasm, the uh, all of the fluids mix together and then flow out the urethra through the tip of the penis. So the semen contains the sperm and all of those products. The release of it is called ejaculate, or sorry, when it's when it is ejaculated, when it is released, it is called ejaculate. The process of releasing it is called ejaculation. Usually about three to five milliliters. Again, so much individual variation. Um, some men produce much less, some men produce much more. It doesn't matter at all. Um, each ejaculation has 200 to 500 million sperm. Compare that to the number of eggs that a female is going to produce uh, if she starts, uh, if she uh, menstruates for about 40 years, which is kind of average, she'll only produce about 400 eggs. So maybe 500. Um, so not, it is not that many, whereas men produce hundreds of millions of sperm every single day. It takes about two weeks from the beginning of spermatogenesis until a sperm is ready to be ejaculated. Now, the external genitalia is the penis uh, and the scrotum, of course. The root of the penis uh, extends inside the body and anchors the penis in the body. There's a root of, a penis, of the penis here and then the bulb of the, of the penis there. 
And um, so the when we measure a penis in animals, because they most animals don't have external penises, they keep their penis inside the body, we actually measure all the way to the root of the penis. Right? Uh, the human penis is about five inches long, which oddly enough, it's about the length of the average human vagina. The uh, body or shaft of the penis is e elongated. It, it can be moved somewhat. Many other animals have <laughs> a lot more control over it, and this is a really hilarious video. Uh, about the tapir, which is uh, an animal that kind of vaguely looks like a pig, even though it's not at all a pig. Uh, and, uh, well, I'll let you watch. The tip of the penis, the swollen, the larger tip, is called the glands. It is at birth covered with a fold of skin called the prepuce or the foreskin. And like I said, the average length is about five inches uh, from where it emerges from the body. The uh, foreskin covers the glands of the penis when the penis is flaccid. And then when the penis becomes erect, the foreskin is pulled back so that when a penis is erect, you can't really tell um, visually whether it was uh, Ha has a foreskin intact. Removal of the foreskin is called circumcision. Uh, it is a very, very safe process. Anything going wrong is extremely rare, uh, but there's also no good medical reason to circumcise a baby. Um, so right now there's no recommendation whether you do it or not. If your religious tradition uh, says that you should, then go ahead and do it. It is not a dangerous procedure at all. Um, the uh, only what times that it is recommended is in areas of the world where there is a high incidence of HIV infection. Circumcision is recommended because it does uh, slow the spread of HIV. So that is one uh, case in which uh, circumcision is recommended. The penis, like the vagina, or sorry, not like the vagina, like the uh, clitoris, is an erectile body. And it has these three pockets of uh, spongy tissue. And uh, the way an erection happens is that blood flows into these spongy spaces. These two on either side are called the corpora cavernosa. Corpus cavernosum is singular. The third one is called the corpus spongiosum. Uh, the cavernosa don't go all the way to the glands, the spongiosum does, and the urethra passes through the spongiosum. The uh, your portion of the urethra that goes through that is called the spongy urethra. So um, all of these uh, spaces have arteries traveling into them that have holes in the walls. And uh, as our, as more fluid, more blood flows into the penis. It flows out of the arteries and into these spongy venous spaces around the artery. That causes these spongy spaces, these venous spaces to swell up. That causes an erection. And then as these swell up, they actually push on and compress the veins that carry blood out of the penis. So the Blood continues to flow into the penis, causing the erection, but it can't flow out. And so that is what causes and maintains the erection. Now, as you can imagine, if blood keeps flowing in for a very, very, very long time and doesn't flow out, that could actually damage the tissue. And that's why if you've heard stories about if you have an erection that lasts more than four hours, uh, see your doctor. That can be a side effect of erectile dysfunction drugs that cause uh, blood to continue to flow into the penis. That can actually cause permanent damage to the penis. So uh, yeah, if you have an erection that lasts longer than four hours, please, please, please do go get medical assistance. Uh, it is a very, very serious condition. So anyway, normally uh, at uh, ejaculation, the blood stops flowing into the penis uh, the um, spongy tissues can then uh, shrink and the blood flows out of the penis. Me uh, the human male does go through a kind of a male menopause. We call it male climacteric. 
the testes decrease in size and with that the levels of testosterone decrease. This can be extremely problematic for a lot of men because uh, testosterone drives sex drive um, and also drives muscle development. And so men become weaker, they lose their sex drive, and this can be really hard to deal with. So it is a, a significant thing. Uh, men can take additional testosterone, but please always talk to your doctor before you do that. The other thing we did talk about prostate enlargement. Um, because the prostate sits at the base of the penis, it can cause erectile dysfunction or impotence. Uh, erectile dysfunction is the ability to inability to achieve an erection, an erection, I don't know why I can't talk, impotence, the inability to maintain an erection. Uh, age makes this more likely because the prostate does enlarge with age normally. Uh, prostate surgery, uh, unfortunately, can also cause erectile dysfunction, which is just cruel if you had prostate surgery to deal with your enlarged prostate or possible prostate cancer, and that left you with erectile dysfunction. That's just not fair. Um, other conditions, other things that can lead to these conditions, heart disease, diabetes, and smoking, so take care of yourself. All right, and that is the end of the male reproductive system.